Good afternoon. Uh, welcome, everyone. Also, those that uh, uh, came to uh, listen to the keynote. I'm Irina Pippa from the Department of Finno Ugrian and Scandinavian Studies and one of the organizers. And I have the great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Asivaka. Uh, he comes uh, from the University of Pennsylvania, where he is a professor of anthropology and director of the Penn Semiotics Lab. He is uh, the president of uh, the Society for Linguistic Anthropology and the editor of the Journal of si Science in Society. And I guess uh, that uh, Professor Aka is uh, one of those persons that really wouldn't need an introduction. Um, his uh, research spans broadly the role of language in human affairs, including the way interpersonal communication gives shape to social institutions like media, money, law, science, education, and the state. And many of us know him for his book, Language and Social Relations, that won uh, Edward Sapi Book Prize in 2008, and the book has made a huge impact, no, not only in uh, linguistic anthropology, but also in social linguistics. And I know him to be an inspiring teacher and mentor. I had the privilege of uh, working as a visiting researcher at the Penn Semiotics Lab a couple of years ago, and uh, the traffic uh, between Helsinki and Pen uh, Philadelphia has not been, fortunately, only one way. This is, uh, I suppose, uh, already the third or fourth, fourth uh, visit uh, to Helsinki. And over the years, uh, uh, Professor Arka has collaborated with researchers from folklore studies, linguistics, and anthropology. And I know that I speak for the whole community here in Helsinki, saying that it's a, a pleasure to welcome him back. But without further ado, the topic of his keynote today is pecuniary media and participation frameworks from Kauris to Bitcoin. Please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Asifaka. Thanks everyone for the invitation to come back to Helsinki. I have grown to love the place. I've been here many times. Uh, I'll be, um, it appears that I'm giving two talks uh, in this, uh, 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 in this uh, colloquium, one today and one tomorrow. Uh, I'll be talking about a range of pecuniary media, some of which you can see pictures of up here, including the kinds of stuff that we call money nowadays. And I'll be developing two main points. The first one is that if we understand the role of discursive semiosis in money conduct, we can readily see that the participatory logics that an enable us to engage in money conduct of any kind are highly non-salient to conscious awareness, and that therefore, more simply, that facts of participation and beliefs about participation are never the same. And secondly, that the same disjuncture between facts of and beliefs about participation can readily be seen in almost any type of social practice uh, 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 and that uh, even ones that self-formulate themselves as having nothing to do with money. Now, the, before we can get to this stuff, the idea that participation just ain't what, it, what we suppose it to be, we first have to first, we have to work through another idea, which is that money and money conduct just ain't what we suppose it to be. And so I will therefore start with that latter theme, and then we'll work our way, way back to the former. So my main uh, concern today is with processes of enregisterment through which money tokens get linked to activity routines that are differentiable within a society as socially recognized registers of conduct. A register is a cultural model of conduct that links perceivable behaviors, what I call exponents of conduct, to a model of how these behaviors are carried out 
who is understood to be doing them, and what they index to others in participation frameworks of social interaction. To describe these variables is to describe the cultural model. Any describable register is simply a socio-historical snapshot of a process of enregisterment through which such models are born and die, or acquire relatively stabilized forms for a while for some given subpopulation in society. Most previous work has concerned itself with registers of speech, the case where the exponents of conduct are speech behaviors like utterances. My concern today is with registers of money token conduct and with the forms of social indexicality associated with such cases. It has long been known that money is intimately linked to language. Here, for example, are some observations made a half century ago by the uh, economic anthropologist Karl Polanyi. In general terms, money is a semantic system similar to speech, writing, or weights and measures, he says. In other place, he says, money is an incompletely unified system, a search for its single purpose, a blind alley. This accounts for the many unavailing attempts at determining the nature and essence of money. We must be content with listing the purposes to which the quantifiable objects actually called money are put. This is achieved by pointing to the situation in which we operate those objects and with what effect. <coughs> Yet, attempts to characterize what Polanyi calls a semantic system have failed, mainly because they rely too heavily on Sasorian ideas about language, which are wholly inadequate for reasoning about the relation of speech to conduct. The issue of how exponents of money token conduct may somehow uh, point to the situation of use is entirely an issue of indexicality. We need to consider forms of discursive semiosis that were not well understood in Polanyi's time. By discursive semiosis, I mean the entire range of ways in which human discourse can be used to typify actual or imaginable states of affairs in the universe, including forms of interpersonal conduct and attributes of those whose conduct it is. Money is not a unified system because it is intimately linked to a great many forms of discursive semiosis, whether oral, written, numerical, algorithmic, customary, or law-based, whether manifest as fiscal policy, computer code, or common sense, through which varied types of money tokens are created and endowed with identifiable use characteristics, or taken up into registers of conduct that differ by social domain within any given society. This is why money is not a unified system, why all attempts to describe its unitary nature and essence fail. Yet the real trouble with the thing called money is that our folk terminology for describing it is wholly inadequate and constitutes a source of perennial mystification, a fact with which we must begin. For instance, none of you have money in your pocket. What you have in your pocket is currency. Although the currency in your possession may consist of pieces of paper or metal, these objects only function as money when you do certain thing with them, and only if, and as long as, sufficiently many others do similar things with them. And coins and currency notes are simply specific types of pecuniary media. You can do similar things with pieces of plastic too, like credit cards, or with handy little booklets like checkbooks, which are not usually called money, but are associated with it. To linger over long on currency is to miss the point. Only 11% of the world's supply of US dollars exists in this form. The rest exists as computer code in banks' ledgers, whose exponents are perceivable only as pixels on an LCD screen. If you chuck the greenbacks, most of the world's uh, dollar supply will survive just fine, thank you. Uh, and credit cards are perhaps best understood as devices for moving pixels around from bank account to bank account, ledger to ledger, screen to screen. A second issue is that uh, pecuniary media differ in limitlessly varied ways across human societies, and activities of using them as money tokens indexically locates the user in a particular stretch of social history, a particular slice of place, time, and community. We are accustomed to the blue kind, up on the slide. Others have been accustomed to the non-blue kinds. 
Think of the blue stuff as indexical of our practices, of our stretch of social space-time, and the red stuff as indexical of other places and times. That is to say, wherever the blue stuff occurs as money, folks like you and me are right there using it. You and I don't belong to the cowrie shell stretches of money token conduct, nor to the beaver pelt or corn or tobacco stretches, uh, but early European settlers in the United States, the folks who lived in colonial Massachusetts or in colonial Virginia in the 17th century, did use some of these pecuniary media, a fact that indexically situates them in socio-historical stretches of money token conduct very different from our own. A third issue is that Anyone who engages in activities involving money tokens in any society is not familiar with most activities involving money tokens in their own society. All of us can buy tubes of toothpaste with pieces of paper, but few can describe how hedge funds or derivatives work. In fact, after the events of 2008, it seems that folks on Wall Street don't know how they work either. But that's another story. The despondency of Wall, Street, of, of, of Wall Street is a distraction best left aside for now. People here and now are very interested in the blue stuff. But our talk is all funny. For instance, just after we conflate money with currency, we are readily inclined to say that the activities on which money occurs are best described as, or even most naturally described as, buying and selling. Part of my goal is to show that this idea is absurd, that this is an absurdly parochial point of view. In fact, producing such talk indexically locates the one whose talk it is as a consumer or retailer. By contrast, the central banks of every country, who are also very interested in the blue stuff, don't speak of money in the sense of individual currency bills, but in terms of the, quote, total money stock, unquote of the country and describe what they do to it not as buying and selling but as creating it or managing it or as regulating its domestic supply capacity or as monitoring its inflationary pressures. It's mostly hydraulic metaphors actually. Each form of money talk has a voicing structure that indexically specifies the social positionality of the one talking. Most activities involving money tokens that occur in any society are not known to all of its members because no one is familiar with all the forms of money talk that occur in it. And sociological asymmetries in forms of money talk indexically differentiate social categories of people linked to each other through it. I've argued elsewhere that asymmetries of enregistrement by social domain within a society are characteristic of all register phenomena. Indeed, such asymmetries are not an inconvenience for us, but precisely what we wish ethnographically to study. Getting clearer about these issues will require showing that getting from beaver pelts to greenbacks was in part a process of standardizing forms of money talk and conduct that is partly analogous to processes through which a so-called standard language is created and differentiated from other speech registers. Just as a standard language ideology obscures facts of speech variation in a community, a standardization of forms of money talk severely impair impairs our reportable intuitions about our own uses of money today. For a long time, economic anthropologists were interested not in the blue stuff at all, they left that to the economists, but in the red stuff. And this is how the academic division of labor stood for a long time. Here, for example, is a depiction from Jackson's 1917 monograph of cowrie usage worldwide. It shows that cowrie shells were used in one way or another in parts of Europe, Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, the Pacific Islands, and even North America. Cowries are ubiquitous natural artifacts made by mollusks. They are found in ancient Egyptian graves. They are used in games like Parchisi or associated with pregnancy or used as amulets in many places and are used inter alia in money-like ways too. And there are numerous other studies of other types of red stuff and of their usage in different parts of the world. More recently, however, things appear to have gone horribly wrong. Here is a remark by a contemporary economic anthropologist, David Graeber. Once the study of primitive money, shell currencies, feather currencies, wampum, Fijian whale teeth, teeth iron bars, and so forth, was the stock and trade of economic anthropology. In recent decades, there's been almost nothing written on the subject. 
James Carrier, James Carrier's otherwise comprehensive handbook of economic anthropology not only considers the matter not, not worth a chapter, it contains not a single mention of wampum or trade beads anywhere in the book. We don't even know what to call such items anymore. Primitive currencies or primitive valuables will obviously lo no longer do. One reason it's hard to come up with, be with better terminology is that there's no consensus on what, if anything, actually makes a string of Indian Ocean beads or California woodpecker scalps different from a shekel or a pound. Is it something in the nature of the object? Is it a matter of the kind of transactions in which it is used? Or is it the conceptual apparatus, the cosmological assumptions, the notions of value surrounding it? It appears that an earlier enthusiasm has shifted to a form of avoidance behavior. What was once called primitive money has now become an unmentionable in the economic anthropology literature. There is not a single mention of wampum or trade beads in the handbook. Yet the reasons for such avoidance are scientifically sound. If you don't even know what to call such items anymore, it is obviously extremely wise never to talk about them. And if there's no consensus on the terminology, it is obviously extremely wise never, ever, ever to publish any articles about them. So anthropological genres of money talk are nowadays manifest as deafening silence. Money talk faces other problems too, as we shall soon see. But we have to start somewhere. So let's start with the most obvious question, how did this deafening silence come about? Some of the problems that culminated in today's deafening silence were brilliantly articulated by Quiggin in a monograph written in 1949. Quiggin was a Cambridge anthropologist. She wrote perhaps the most comprehensive book ever written on forms of money around the world. She wrote it in 1949. In those days, they called it primitive money. And it begins with a lovely sentence which, that exhibits some awareness of the voicing structure of forms of money talk, which a great many people in the anthropological literature on money love to quote. It's a lovely sentence because although what she says about everyone is not true as we have just seen, it does contain an embryo of truth embedded in it, namely what she says about economists, a point to which I return in later discussion. Even more enchanting is the struggle in which she is engaged in the opening pages, a struggle to get beyond a thing focal perspective on what the book itself is about. A gold ring may be worn in the nose or appear in a collection of Greek coins. Brick tea weighed and stamped like a coin may be crumbled and drunk. Salt may be a condiment or a dowry. Strings of shell uh, discs may be merely ornamental in one island and objects of barter, currency, or tokens of value in another. In other words, the kinds of things her book is about are used in different ways by the people whose things they are, and some things are especially troublesome. It is still more difficult to classify the varied ornaments. Is a string of shell money no longer currency when you wear it around your neck? Is a sovereign no longer money when, you dang when dangled on your watch chain? In other words, when is something money? It gets worse. Shells are merely shells on one island but are used in trade ex exchange with another island where they form the currency. In other words, where is something money? And there's more. For the two parties in a transaction may themselves stand in different categories. The trader may consider that he's paying current money when he buys a fowl for 10 lengths of brass wire, while the seller regards the exchange as mere barter. In short, sorry, for whom is something money? All of these questions can be given taxonomy-based answers, and Quiggin does give some. But the taxonomic answers of yesterday lead to the deafening silences of today. The question that remains unanswered in this entire literature is, how do you know? What are your observables? What criteria guide your observations? How can you use words like money to describe such cases? And what exactly are you describing? Things or activity routines in which things play a part? And how do you distinguish these from all other activities involving them? But questions like, how does the anthropologist know, are almost irrelevant unless they are linked to a different question. How do the users know? In other words, 
if people do different things with salt on different days, if folks in neighboring tribes do different things with the shells, the question really becomes, how does anyone on any given day, in any given social interaction, know what is being done with something at that time? And how do they know what response is appropriate to such behavior when it occurs? Whether you're worrying about beeswax or woodpecker scalps or about the stuff that is in your pocket right now, the real question is, for anything that anyone has ever called money, how do its users know what it is? This amounts to the question, uh, what are the indexicals of person, place, and time that differentiate money token activities from other activities, specify the participation frameworks in which such activities appropriately occur, and if symmetrically grasped by the parties to such conduct, allow social interactions to unfold among them? Before I turn to these issues, we should first consider what it means to shift our perspective from things to forms of interpersonal conduct involving things. The important thing about this slide is that we're looking not at things, but at activity routines involving things. Each of these images depicts a small stretch of social history, organized by sociocentric, mutually coordinated, and interpersonally recurrent activity routines. Before it can be used as money, the tobacco in the top left has to be grown each year in seasonal agricultural cycles through a coordination of the activities of many people, and once grown, always already acquires many other uses long before it becomes a money token anywhere. The cowries that are lying there in a neat little pile in the middle slide have to be brought here and piled first, which means that in the case of the 18th and 19th century practices that we know best, they have to be harvested from the sea in places like the Maldives Islands uh, year after year, buried in the ground to kill the mollusks that live inside them, sun-dried on mats, and then transported by ship, whether to Zanzibar or Bengal, where they acquire many uses that have nothing to do with money, and some that do. As for the ore on the right, where did it come from? It has first to be extracted from the ground, which means that people must learn to differentiate it from the rock in which it is embedded, and by acquiring a symmetric grasp of coordinated multi-party activities, learn to dig mine shafts to extract ore from rock and to melt it into the form that lies before you here. And it has to be available in sufficient supply, which usually means that it has already acquired other uses before any type of money token conduct can become associated with it. This is the first European precious metal coin manufactured in Lydia, Central Asia, present-day Turkey, around 6th century BC. It is associated with a new set of activity routines involving metallic ore, which include making discs like this from it and using them as money tokens. But if these are new activity routines, how do people come to know what they are? How is awareness of this issue symmetrically grasped by sufficiently many people so that conduct involving it can effectively count as money token conduct in some society? The issue of symmetric grasp is vital, of course, since no mutually calibrated social interaction is possible unless the parties to this interaction can typify the exponents of conduct, the things perceivably deployed as money tokens in conduct, in relatively symmetric ways and assign them comparable significance. More generally, the question is one of the differentiability of exponents of conduct from other things on their identifiability and characterizability as objects of some specific kind, which require criteria that differentiate them from all other entities in the universe and specify some among them as money tokens while and others as not money tokens. After all, the money token is often just a handshake. How do you learn that what's crucial is not the hand but the thing in someone's hand? And once you know which one it is, how do you know the what, where, when of its deployment in conduct? The way in which hu the human animal achieves this is through the denotational machinery of discursive semiosis, whereby all such questions can be posed and in principle settled. Questions of the characterizability of entity types through lexemic denotation, of the, uh, uh, of the identifiability of specific tokens, this coin, not that coin, through selective dyxis, of when to use and when not to use such stuff through modalized predication, of symmetric interpersonal grasp through talk with others about it. Which is why humans tend to have artifacts and activity routines of such kinds, and gophers and marmosets and porcupines apparently do not. 
But such denotational machinery is merely a fragment of the forms of discursive semiosis involved in knowing the what, where, when of money token conduct, as we shall soon see. And what do you do when you don't know? Well, you can always ask a question. Since trade often involves travel, George Knapp, writing in the 1920s, describes this as the traveler's problem. Every traveler entering a new country asks the name of this unit, whether accounts are in marks, francs, crown or crowns or sterling. When this question is answered, the traveler asks what the usual means of payment look like and what they are worth in the unit of that country. He is then in a position to make payments himself. Knapp is, of course, writing two and a half millennia after coinage has been introduced into Europe, at a time when many forms of money talk and money token conduct are well known to the common sense of Europeans, so that the early 20th century traveler can already presuppose that every country already has a distinct coinage. Under these conditions, a traveler can simply ask questions like, what's yours called? What does it look like? What's it worth? But if we go back two and a half thousand years to a stretch of social history like this, the situation is different. At this time, metal coins are fairly new. The Greeks have adopted the Lydian practice of minting coins. Different city-states have different coins. It is also a heteroglossic situation. We know from Homer that many dialects of Greek, like Ionic, Aeolic, Doric, and Attic, are probably spoken in the circuits in which trade occurs. To say nothing of Lydian, which is an Anatolian language more closely related to Hittite than to Greek. And some degree of multilingualism is needed in order to do trade. Not everyone uses token coins. Not everyone knows what they are. Any coin presupposes a metasemiotic framework of its own identifiability and characterizability as a coin of some specific kind, as a condition on its usability as a coin. When the presupposition is not satisfied, when someone is not familiar with it, explicit descriptions are needed to identify and characterize it. Suppose you meet someone who has heard of coins but doesn't know where this one is from. They ask you, what do you do? There's no getting around proper name dikesis at this point. You might say something like, this ain't just a head, it's Athena's head, using the personal proper name of the goddess. And this ain't just an owl, it's Athena's owl, the owl of wisdom associated with the goddess. And then you might point out that the goddess has a namesake in a city name. It's from Athens, don't you see? If your interlocutor knows something about Greek religion, even if he doesn't know much about coins, he gets it. If not, there goes the evening. In such a scenario, uh, speech or verbal signs and metal discs, pictorial signs, are deployed together as perceivable exponents of conduct. The discursive exponents of conduct, the utterances you've just produced, are meta-signs that typify their object signs, the metallic discs in your hand, identifying and characterizing them as coins produced by the mint at Athens, thus giving them a very specific object formulation. In cases where no script occurs on the money token, accompanying utterances and their didactically anchored descriptions can clarify the what, who, where attributes of the thing in question. What happens when script does occur? How is the what, who, where typified in those cases? It tends to be typified by the script artifact itself. Here is a Mesopotamian clay tablet. It says that Amil Mura will pay 330 measures of barley to the bearer of the tablet at harvest time. We can see that the activity to be con conducted by it is metasemiotically typified by descriptions that occur as script on the money token itself. Do what? Pay 330 measures of barley. When? At harvest time. Who will do this? Amil Mera. To whom? The bearer of the tablet. So the what, when, who, to whom organization of conduct is explicitly denoted by the script written on it. But the where is not specified by the notational content. So where will this happen? The where of conduct is typified not by the notational content of the cuneiform script, but by the ability to read the script. If you can read the script, you are likely to be a resident of the locale and not of Europe or someplace else. So the readability of the script is implicitly indexical of the where of reading and transaction of the stretch of social history of which this tablet is a fragment. Here are some script artifacts of a more familiar kind. How do they work? <coughs> 
The trouble is that we can't begin our discussion of script artifacts with these ones because we have too many naturalized assumptions about what they are and how they work, and as I hope to show, many of our reportable intuitions are incorrect. But we'll return to them in due course. Here are some unfamiliar looking script artifacts. These were used as money tokens in rather distinct stretches of place and time in early America. We'll take a careful look at these in just a moment. But before we do so, let's take a look at other types of artifacts in early America and the conditions under which they served as money tokens. In the 17th century, due to the shortage of coin available to the colonists, Corn and tobacco were stipulated to be money tokens. In 1630, a law is passed in the Plymouth Colony of Massachusetts. It is ordered that corn shall pass for payments for all debt at the usual rate it is sold for unless money or beaver is, is expressly named as payment. And in the South, as we are told by McLeod 1898, oops, Virginia, Maryland, and North Carolina used tobacco as currency throughout most of the colonial period. The Virginia legislature in 1642 made it legal tender. Nearly all business transactions in Maryland were conducted in terms of tobacco. North Carolina used tobacco as money until the outbreak of the revolution. So corn is declared legal tender in 1630, but it is not paper currency. Tobacco is declared legal tender in 1642, but it is not paper currency. But wait. What's the difference in the forms of social interaction possible through corn and tobacco before and after the law? Let us bear in mind that before the law is passed, corn and tobacco are not just things, but things that play a part in already established sociocentrically organized activity routines in these places. They are cultivated and harvested in recurrent seasonal agricultural cycles through the use of tools and implements, through the discursive coordination of calendrically sequenced agricultural activities that involve many people, and once harvested each year, each year they are used as comestibles. The passage of these laws in 1630 in Massachusetts and in 1642 in Virginia induces a segmentation of activity routines. It introduces a new use in each locale. After the law is passed in Massachusetts in 1630, corn is used as money token and as comestible. After the law is passed in Virginia in 1642, corn is used as money token and as comestible, whether chewed or inhaled. But the new usage, underlined, is specific to participation frameworks of social interaction. That is to say, you cannot use tobacco as money tokens in Massachusetts. You cannot use corn as money tokens in Virginia. In other words, the appropriateness conditions on use are different. One is appropriate in the north, the other in the south. We have two different registers of money token conduct, two new ones. But the physical objects, bundles of corn or tobacco, themselves contain no instructions on the how, when, with whom of this new usage. The law is not written on the corn or the tobacco. Only those who are acquainted with criterial forms of discursive semiosis, namely with the new legislation in each locale, and independently of their familiarity with corn as such or with tobacco as such, can use their knowledge of the law to segment their own activities into money token types versus other types, or know which one is relevant to some here and now of social interaction. And in order for any actual money token conduct ever to occur, many people in the North must be acquainted with the 1630 law and many people in the South with the 1642 law. If only one person knows of them, corn and tobacco can never function as money tokens. Others can learn of the new activity routines involving corn or tobacco only by learning about the new law directly or indirectly. We know that literacy is not widespread at this time. So the law can become known only through some form of verbal retelling. Oops, I forgot to do this one, sorry. Uh, the legal discourse has to be recycled into vernacular idioms in order for it to effectively to regulate people's activities. It must become part of an oral tradition. 
To most people, the activity segmentations introduced by the law become known as common custom. Now recall Quiggin on similar segmentations of activity routines elsewhere. A gold ring may be worn in the nose or appear in a collection of Greek coins. Brick tea weighed and stamped like a coin may be crumbled and drunk. Salt may be a condiment or a dowry. Strings of shell discs may be merely ornaments on one island and objects of barter, currency, or tokens of value, in other words. This is much like Massachusetts corn. Before 1630, you could just eat it. And after 1630, you could both eat it and use it as currency, at least in Massachusetts. And it is much like Virginia tobacco. Before 1642, you could just smoke it or chew it. And after 1642, you could both smoke and chew it and use it as currency, at least in Virginia. All differentiations of sociocentric activity routines involving money tokens rely on forms of discursive semiosis to become intersubjectively ratified social realities. Whether these be written statutes or matters of so-called custom or common law. Quiggin's own data, which is, consists largely of museum objects at the Cambridge Museum, were gathered by various people at various times and mainly by people who paid no attention to the forms of discursive semiosis through which activity differentiation differentiations became or become symmetrically known and she is aware of this difficulty. Unfortunately it is too late now, she says, to discover actual or ceremonial uses of many of these objects. All that can be done is to collect what information is still available. Now let's focus on early American script artifacts some script artifacts that are used in, uh, as money tokens in early uh, North America are actually designed for other uses, like these playing cards. They are much like cowrie shells or corn or tobacco. In one sense, they have use differentiations, but do not describe them. The forms of discursive semiosis that specify their money token use are off the page. There is, of course, a little scrawl on the card at the bottom left but the scroll neither licenses their routinized money token use nor fully describes the unique use to which they were once put. These cards were given as money tokens to workmen to build a cathedral in St. Louis around 1790 or so. Whatever circumstances enabled this irregular use to occur are underspecified by the scroll itself. As we turn to script artifacts, however elaborate, we should always keep in mind both forms of discursive semiosis, the ones that are on the page, namely two forms, and the ones that are off the page, since neither alone will tend to suffice. Given the shortage of coin in colonial America, uh, laws are passed in various provinces that formulate script artifacts as pecuniary media. Here's an example from Massachusetts. Uh, to facilitate the movement of exchange, the general court ordered in 1692 that all bills of credit issued forth by order of the general court of the late colony of Massachusetts Bay shall pass current within this province in all payments equivalent to money and in all public payments at 5% advance. At this time, the word money is used only for precious metal coins, such as the ones minted, minted in England and used throughout the colonies. In saying that bills of public credit shall be treated as equivalent to money, but only in Massachusetts, the law is formulating bills as new pecuniary media for local use, a usage indexically anchored to participation frameworks of social interaction whose participant roles are filled by people living in Massachusetts. Such a new usage requires the government to deal with its novelty, the novelty of this new pecuniary media, to persuade people that paper money is as good as stamped silver. It offers an inducement for usage, namely a 5% dis discount on tax payments made with them. Similar laws are passed in other colonies. After these laws are passed, we begin to see a wide variety of pecuniary media of, uh, that are made of paper that have a dedicated use as money tokens. But the novelty of each such case raises widespread questions among the public. What is it? What's it for? Uh, such pecuniary media therefore tend to contain elaborate self-descriptions of their own characteristics, of the kinds of activities possible through them, and of the time, place, and characteristics of users or issuers. 
So this one says, this indented bill shall pass current for one shilling in the province of Pennsylvania according to an act of assembly of the said province made in the 17th year of the reign of King George II, dated August 1, 1744, 12 pence. What is it? This thing in your hand is an indented bill for one shilling. Where is it used? Pennsylvania. When is it issued? And we're given two dates. In fact, we have a, a dual, the, there, are, there are two different zero points of time reckoning. The birth of Christ and the reign of King George II. Uh, two frameworks of cosmographic centering of the, of the object itself. It formulates his user as a Christian subject of the king. Says who? seal and signature. That's what ratifies it uh, as in fact an object that you should be inclined to trust. Remember, there's massive mistrust. People are used to metal, precious metal coin, but this stuff is very new. This one says, the bearer is entitled to receive 65 Spanish mil dollars or an equal sum in gold or silver according to a resolution of Congress of the 14th uh, January 1779. What's it telling the person whose hand is holding it? What's the news? You can get gold or silver for me. This is, uh, in fact, absolutely crucial, not information. Otherwise, people would just not take it seriously at all. What about this one? The bearer hereof is entitled to six dollars and ninetieths of a dollar, which will be received for taxes agreeably, agreeably to the requisition of Congress of the 27th September 1785. What's the big news here? You can pay taxes with me. And in fact, to invite this kind of response, of people getting very excited about the usage of these things. Because widespread paper currency is new, it has to contain explicit descriptions of what it's for. This one. The possessor of this bill shall be paid by the treasurer of the colony of Connecticut two shillings and six pence lawful money by the first day of January AD 1782. It calls itself a bill and differentiates itself from lawful money. What's the big picture? I am not money, but you can get some. It's very important to understand that both the self-description of these pieces of paper and the commonplace, common sense about them is that they're not money. <laughs> um, uh, this is a Georgia issue uh, bill. It says, uh, this certificate for the support of the continental troops and other expenses of government entitled the bearer to $8 in continental currency according to the resolution of assembly, Ju June 8, 1777. In short, I am no dollar, but I support the troops. And I don't say this in order to seem funny, although I realize that it must seem so. It is extremely important to realize that the great variety of pecuniary <laughs> media that are emerging around this time, many of which have greatly specific forms of dedicated use and very specific forms of persuasion that appeal to completely local understandings of what's important and what's not, right? And this just needs to be made laboriously explicit today, but in fact, the structure of relevance was entirely known to the people whose hands were holding it, and for them, this kind of stuff was the relevant news to be getting. The bills we've just seen tell you that they're not money and what you can do to get some the money talk of script artifacts produces confused money talk in everyday life. Here's a quote from the Banker's Magazine of 1858. The organizing of debt into currency is the prevailing error of this commercial age. To whatever extent this system is in use in any country, the precious metals are expelled. For money and debt are natural antagonists like fire and water. We cannot have our cake and eat it too. We must accept money or debt for currency. We cannot have them both for the same sum at the same time. In short, money here again means precious metal coin as opposed to debt, which means paper, paper bills. Here we have a more elaborate taxonomy. Uh, for our present purposes, says uh, Mr. Temple, barter is the exchange of one article for another. Currency implies exchange through a medium. Money is uh, that the medium is a token. 
So what you find is these curious sets of strange taxonomies that show up in this literature at this time, where everyone is trying to give a taxonomic structure to this assortment of things that are now suddenly available, all unfamiliar, many of them apparently not trustworthy, some of them perhaps so, right? And this one is actually just of relevance because Quiggin, in that book that I showed you before, begins her discussion with a, with a discussion by struggling against Temple's taxonomy, sh refuting it, uh, and then trying to move on, right? So these uh, kinds of attempts to understand uh, these folk taxonomies were of great importance uh, and led to mixed results in different cases. So the new pecuniary media that are made of paper and are treated by suspicion uh, require that such suspicion be assuaged in some way. So in order to assuage doubt, many of them cite the statute or legislation that issues them. So this one at the top left says, pursuant to a law of the state of New Jersey passed in the year 1786. The top right, according to an act of assembly of the state of Maryland made on the 8th day of May 1781. Bottom left, pursuant to an ordinance of the General Assembly of South, uh, uh, of South Carolina passed the 8th day of July 1779. Bottom right, according to a resolution of Congress passed at Philadelphia, February 17, 1776. Who prints it? Where does it come from? How does it come into your hands? It seems that everyone's printing money the, in, in, at this time. So the, the printer's name on the top left is John Holt, as you can see in the bottom. The one on the right and the bottom you can see it's Hall and Sellers are the other printers. Bottom left is Ben Franklin and Hall, the same Hall as on the other on the other one. So the state actually does not have the exclusive entitlement to print paper money tokens at this time and does not have it for more than a hundred years beyond this date. So in fact, uh, uh, lots and lots of people are, are printing money and it's entirely legal to do so. And the printer's name actually appears on some of them. Now, uh, soon, you don't actually, you get a massive proliferation. That was around the 1770s and 80s, right? Those three bills. Around 1810 or so, we find a different situation. Merchants, tradesmen, manufacturers, stage owners, tavern keepers, ferrymen, and uncharted banks started issuing money tokens, and New England was flooded with paper money of the worst description, according to Barnard, 1917. So the, the, the next kind of thing to notice is that this is an example of the kinds of uh, forms of money he's talking about. So a general assortment of groceries, six and a quarter cents, the, the name of the store that issues it is Chest of Tea and Hogshead. This is uh, token number 233, and it says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand in groceries or Philadelphia banknotes at number 130 North Water Street, six and a quarter cents, signed John Thompson. So this kind of m money token, this form of pecuniary media can be redeemed for groceries at his own store, and for Philadelphia bank notes, two entirely different kinds of things, right, that you can get for it. It's not therefore like the grocery store coupons that we know today. You can't go to a grocery store and get uh, euros or dollars for, for those, right? Now, a whole bunch of forms of pecuniary media uh, are produced by things that call themselves banks. But what does the word bank mean at this time? In the 18th century, uh, uh, in North America, the word bank could mean several things. One would be a, corp a, a, a kind of a corporate institution like the Bank of England, but there wasn't anything like that in North America. Secondly, it could mean an issue of bills. So for example, Rhode Island might, uh, might issue, quote, a bank of 40,000 pounds. <laughs> right, unquote. This usage went out of, uh, uh, became obsolete. Uh, and third, it could mean an association of private persons who issued their own bills of credit. Uh, most banks were unincorporated, so that, for example, the chest of tea and ho uh, hogshead, right, could well be call calling itself a bank. But it was producing these those scripts. Now, these ones using are are using printing machines, and they have nice 
pictures and stuff like that, right? Uh, so we're inclined to take them more seriously just for that reason. They look a little more like stuff we're used to nowadays, right? Uh, uh, so the top one, uh, 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 the new is produced by uh, the New Hope Delaware, Delaware Bridge Company of Lambertsville, New Jersey. The bottom one is produced by the Somerset Worcester, Worcester can I read it? Yeah, Worcester uh, Savings Bank. Uh, and so we get, in fact, other ones like this one is produced by the original Fringe uh, and Worsted Yarn Warehouse. Uh, and this one is for 50 cents. And once again, you can get, uh, if you show up with this note, you can get either, uh, I promise to pay on demand in goods or Philadelphia bank notes, 50 cents. And finally, we've got the Piscataqua Exchange Bank, uh, $20. Now, the money tokens of the kind shown in the previous slides, which we are, which were issued by these organizations, were often linked to specific sortal classes of objects, namely specified kinds of things for which specific kinds of money tokens could be used in transactions. Here, for example, is a money token from Richmond, Virginia, from 1861. So it. You know, necessity is the mother of invention. I guess that's the motto of the of the of the person who made the money token. A Southern Exchange Office. The address is given. I promise to pay at my office five cents. And five cents of what? Uh, of f either flour, uh, baled bay, oats, and woods, etc. Where the etc. means whatever else is in his store, right? Uh, or in exchange for bankable funds at my office when presented in sums of five dollars. In other words, if you show up with how many that would be five, f um, a, th a thousand. I don't know twenty. I don't know. Uh, you, you, you've been saving it up for a while. You can get five uh, dollars in other kinds of things, right? Uh, uh, so, so you, the point here is that the idea that. Anything like what we call money today simply doesn't exist at this time, nor is the idea that this thing called money is usable for everything, <laughs> right? Uh, that's not the case. Moreover, that's not a peculiarity of mid-19th century America. We find this all over the world, <laughs> right? So here is a discussion of the Tiv of uh, 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 Northern Nigeria by Bohannon, which is also a system that was in, uh, in its heyday in the 19th century, which involved iron bars. And uh, uh, the objects, right, uh, you know, that could be, uh, uh, that could be, uh, that were transactionables among the Tiv uh, 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 of Nigeria, uh, belonged to three, three classes of entities or, or groupings of objects. Class one, which contains chickens, goats, yams, corn, pe pepper, other local foodstuff, household utensils, tools, uh, and so forth, right? These, all these objects in class one can be tra ex exchanged for each other. Uh, in class two, you've got cattle, slaves, and metal bars, and a certain kind of cloth. All of these can be exchanged for each other. And the third class of women as spouses, which is involves things like uh, dowry uh, are a very special case, and they're treated again very differently. So the notion that B B Bohannon himself used the term spheres of exchange to talk about this phenomenon. But in fact, all he's talking about are registers of transactional conduct in which certain classes of objects belong together uh, as belonging to the same sortal kind of transactionables, right? And in fact, the situation is, from the point of view of the selectivity of, of kinds of transactables not that much different from the case that we saw in Northern America. Every, every locale is, of course, in some way unique. But we find th uh, this, this, this selectivity of transactional kinds showing up all over the world. Um, now, what's a coin, right? The variety of these pecuniary media raises issues about the identity conditions under which they count as coinage or money. For many pecuniary media of this time, if you ask the question, are these coins, the question has no straightforward answer. At this date, namely 1701, there was a scarcity of change, we are told again by Barnard, who's a historian. Not a few individuals stamped pieces of brass and tin and palmed them on the community at a penny each. Virginia furnishes two further examples of tokens of home manufacture. They're, they're, 
there's a typo here. The first was issued in 1714 by Richard Dawson of Gloucester County, Virginia. They were of one shilling value and probably of little importance. In 1773 and 74, many half pennies and probably a few pennies were issued in the same colony. colony. It is presumed that they were not authorized coins because in 1782, which is about a decade later, Thomas Jefferson wrote, in Virginia, coppers have never been in use. Now, the fact is that uh, what Jefferson says is at one level simply false. However, we cannot impugn his honesty at all because the, f the, f the, f the reason why his statement does not conform to the facts is very different. <laughs> uh, which has to do with the voicing structure of uh, who can get to call, whom does it count as money uh, for. Uh, the, the script on the coppers made by John Higley of Connecticut from 1739 says things like, value me as you please, I am a good copper. Homemade copper coins, right? So all answers to the question, are these coins have a voicing structure? Yes, to the, if you are, if the one being asked is a user, no. If the one being asked represents the state. And both are answers are true answers. Which is why, you see, it's not that Jefferson is, he, what he's saying is true from the positionality from which he speaks. Okay? And, and the idea here is that whatever the coin itself says, no license to issue coppers had been issued by the new and fledgling government of the United States of America two folks in Virginia in that, at that time, nor before uh, 1776 had the British Crown issued any license to make coins in Virginia. So from the point of view of whichever state or ego you're speaking, there were no coins. But of course, from the point of view of John Higley and many others like them, there have been copper coins in, in Connecticut for a very long time. Here are some of the things which I perhaps I'll discuss tomorrow uh, because I may be uh, taking up too much time. What do some of these coins say? Now, throughout the 19th century, the question of what pecuniary media are and who can issue them is hotly contested, often taking the form of legal battles. Here's an example. In 1862, the New York legislature attempted to solve the problem by passing a law prohibiting the issue of tokens. No private corporation, banking association, firm, or individual shall make, issue, circulate, or pay any note, check, memorandum, token, or other obligation for a less sum than one dollar to be received or used in lieu of lawful money of the United States. So this, this particular law uh, uh, mentions money tokens of small denomination. The, in other words, it's trying to restrict small denomination. Many other laws were passed which incrementally de dealt with coinage as a whole and with en many kinds of paper bill denominations. However, the issue of tokens did not cease with the passage of the law making their coinage illegal. The law was passed July 1862 and the greatest issue of tokens came in 1863. And so the efficacy of any one law was limited at the time it was promulgated. The legal battles in question took many decades to achieve fully effective control over the issuance of and the forms of pecuniary media, right? Uh, and, and these were battles that involved, there were many kinds of battles. There were battles between uh, 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 the, the varied states of the Union and their citizens. They were trying to pass the battles between the federal government and the state governments because even if the federal government could eliminate people like John Higley, New Jersey and Connecticut and so forth were printing their state money tokens of which I haven't given you examples, right? So in fact, it took a long time. Let's leave that aside. Maybe we'll come back to it. I take it that people are familiar with Austin's discussion of performativity, the idea that utterances like I pronounce you husband and wife don't describe the world but perform actions that create social facts when certain felicity conditions are met. In this case, that the one uttering it is a priest, a naval captain, and so forth, at, at sea, or a judge, uh, and if felicitously performed, after that, uh, a social category, they alter, these utterances alter the social category to which the man and woman belong. For example, they can now file taxes together, their offsprings become entitled to their property as inheritance, and so on. Here's a brief excerpt from his discussion of the form that performative locutions can take. We said that 
in a performative utterance there is something which is at the moment of uttering being done by the person uttering where there is not in the verbal formula a reference to the person doing the uttering by means of the pronoun I or by his personal name then in fact he will be referred to in one of two ways in verbal utterances by his being the person who does the uttering in written utterances or inscriptions by his appending his signature the I who is doing the action does thus come essentially into the picture you are warned that the bull is dangerous is equivalent to I John Jones warn you that the bull is dangerous the written version versus the spoken version or the bull is dangerous signed John Jones now it is easy to see that the British pound uses the utterable version and the American dollar uses the written version so the English pound says if you see at the top uh, I, pro I promise to pay uh, on demand uh, uh, the pair on demand the sum of five pounds and it's the utterable version I promise to pay is personalized by the picture of the Queen the one on the bottom the American dollar relies on the inscriptional form if you look at the bottom left uh, uh, the left of uh, uh, side the note is legal tender for all debts public and private uh, private and then it has two signatures uh, tr the treasurer of the United States and the secretary of the Treasury now it makes no sense to sense to ask whether these sentences are true or false they are performative locutions if felicitously performed they constitute social facts in the United States only the US Congress has the power the constitutional right to uh, issue US dollars but they can delegate it to various p personnel such as the Secretary of the Treasury who simply speaks for the Congress uh, executes in executing the task so We've been focusing a lot on the special case of state-issued money tokens, at least in some cases, starting from the Lydian and Athenian coins, which were made by city-states. Initially, they have images. Later on, you get forms of script on them. Early American ones contain performative locutions of various kinds, specifying the kinds of activities to be done through them. Later American bills become progressively less specific in descriptions or less selective for activities. It's a story of decreasing indexical selectivity for the kinds of activities to be carried out through them. And we can see this in more recent versions like, like these. So this is uh, 1862. What we now call greenbacks don't yet exist. But this is the first greenback-like federal note. The picture, there's a picture of the Treasury of the United States, the treasurer, which is, the ma his name is Chase, and the bank is linked to that name and says, now if you look at the bottom, the obverse side, it says, uh, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private, except duties on imports and interest on the public debt. And it is receivable in payment of all loans made to the United States. So you can't use it for custom duties, nor for interests on the national debt. For that, there's another one. This is the U.S. Silver Dollar Certificate of 1886 with a picture of Martha Washington. This certificate is receivable for customs. So if you look at on the, on the bottom, this certificate is receivable for customs, taxes, and all public debts. So there's a segmentation of the kinds of activities that can be done through each kind of dollar bill. Each is restricted to certain kinds of activities. This one uses the universal quantifier all debts public and private so in other words right its didactic selectivity for routines for activity routines that can be performed through it has decreased uh, and and the universal quantifier simply marks the lack of didactic selectivity thus making it appear to be eternally and always usable in all things the greenback came in comes into existence in the 1930s so in other words our idea that there is something called universal money is less is about 80 years old it's a it's a fashion of speaking and a fashion of governance that is very recent okay uh, by our I mean in the United States though, though frankly there are similar struggles between local and and centralized governments in money token uh, 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 money printing in Europe as well 
Now you get similar kinds. Now today, the, the, the regime of universal quantifiers and didactic non-selectivity has become internationalized. So you get similar kinds of non-selective descriptions in many other contemporary varieties of state-issued money tokens. So the New Zealand dollar says, around the middle of the left side, it's that it is legal tender for five dollars, and then, which is a performative, right, uh, uh, f formulation, and there's a signature of the governor on the top left. The Papua New Guinea Kina says, again, on the right-hand side of the picture uh, uh, of the bird, legal tender throughout Papua New Guinea, signature of Secretary of Department of Finance below it. The Australian note, the performative statement occurs uh, on the left of uh, the picture of the, of the person. It says, this Australian note is legal tender throughout the Australian territories, and then you have two signatures above it, the Secretary of the Treasury and the Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia. So these contemporary forms all say everywhere, and this one says everywhere in this country or everyone in the territories, right? So in fact, the performative acts they constitute specify activity routines that have become less selective than previous Australian bills. And now you're beginning to see that there's a kind of relatively internationalized discourse genre of the forms of money talk that appear on the bill itself, right? Now every performative act act has many felicity conditions and is defeasible for all of them. In fact, the number of forms of defeasibility of any performative act is equals at least the number of felicity conditions that it has. Now early notes call attention to their own felicity conditions, at least the one that matters the most. This one says, death to counterfeit at the very bottom. Do you see that? Right? This one says, also at the bottom, tis death to counterfeit, except it's upside down, right? And this one says, on the top, to counterfeit is death, right? Okay, so now, the interesting thing is that this genre, once a genre of money talk on a bill gets well known, right? In this case, flagging the felicity conditions of its, of its own existence, right? And usability as a money token. Once it gets widespread, even counterfeit bills use it. So this one is counterfeit, and it says that it is issued by resolution of Congress passed at Philadelphia, February 1776. You've seen where that genre partial comes from. We've seen authentic bills carrying that kind of language. The second one, on, the second one on the right says, uh, is also counterfeit, and it says it is issued by the British colony of New York, and it says it's death, tis death to counterfeit. Below, I don't know if you can see it. Mm -hmm. There we go, right? So when counterfeit bills do it, right, they are performing the defeasibility of the state's performativity while appearing to uphold it. Now, no one is fully proficient in a register of conduct unless they know when not to engage in it. <laughs> for speech registers, this is well known, so that, for example, elite ac speakers of elite accents will often downshift <laughs> Uh, when they, uh, uh, in the case of British RP, for example, if you go to the local pub, you will tend to downshift in order to be more socially acceptable and uh, among the folks uh, who hang out there. In general, you have to read the construable context of action, the multi-channel -cha sign configuration that counts as the conduct, as the as the context of of the current next of the next act. Read it as a cotex before you do act. Now this is characteristically the case for money token conduct as well. The Malay fishermen of Langkawi are quite willing to engage in commercial exchanges, though they can only legitimately do so with comparative strangers, for such relations are seen as incompatible with the moral bonds of kinship. So the, the Malay fishermen have to construe interactants as non-kin before they engage in money token conduct. In print cultures like 19th century America, we have etiquette guides that describe the do's and don'ts. So here is one which is called Miss Leslie's Behavior Book. The author describes the rules of etiquette pertaining what it is to be a lady in mid 19th century Philadelphia. And it includes everything from how to dress, how to travel, how to enter someone's house, how to borrow, how to accept a gift, how to take a cruise, and various such things. Uh, it also describes how to raise children. 
All this we have seen and the mothers have never checked it. To permit children to ask visitors for pennies or sixpences is mean and contemptible. And if money is given them by a guest, they should be made to return it immediately. The idea here is that unless, unless you train your kids the, uh, this procedure, their asking visitors for money will make you unladylike. You see, that's why it's, it's in the book. Okay, so the point is that that these kinds of conditions of when when to engage in some form of many token conduct and when not to are again universally attested, as far as I know, a everywhere that anyone has ever looked at this question. Right. Uh, now let's turn to the issue that I raised in an earlier slide about red and blue. Uh, uh, um, money tokens, which I had, the, I used those colors very early on. So, uh, so basically, what we've been seeing is that is that these American uh, 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 in, in, uh, focusing now on the on the various kinds forms of pecuniary media attested in North America. What we have seen seeing is that is that the, the state-issued money tokens, focusing only on those ones now for a moment, right, are changing uh, in various characteristics. But if you expand that to the, to the class of paper money tokens, including some of the non-state-issued ones, right, the changes are uh, 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 even more uh, uh, noticeable. Each script artifact describes the attributes of the thing in your hand, and then it enumerates a set of predicates. You know, uh, you can pay taxes with me, you can get gold or silver for me, right? So there's a Boolean conjunct of attributes or properties that are inscribed directly on these on these coins, which are explicit metapragmatic instructions on what to do with me and what I and and so forth. And, and so these uh, formulate the entity type and the types of activities that are possible through these kinds of objects. And they are, in many cases, also describing the participation frameworks in which, under which, in terms of region, place, and the type of activity, right? Um, now, there's a way of, of specifying this, right? Eventually, this, the federal government becomes the sole issuer. But you can see that in all those cases, Pecuniary media are never just pecuniary media alone. And to see this more clearly, we could ask this question. How does the red stuff change into the blue stuff? So what I'm going to try to do is to give you a diagrammatic walk through some of the material we've been looking at, right? Namely, what is it, right? In the, in the early ones, they called themselves bills, but n exchangeable for lawful money, in other words, I am not lawful money, I'm just a bill exchangeable for some, right? Later on, notes and bills are called money. <laughs> but this isn't, isn't until the late 19th century, though there are other pecuniary media that contrast with it. Where can it be used? So some of the ones that we saw can only be used at a single store, like the, like the, the chest what's it called, the tea and the chest of and tea of hogs, hog's head or something like this, right? Um, uh, tea and hog's head, yeah. A uh, chest of tea and hog's head, that's it. Uh, or the or the Delaware Bridge Company, right? Uh, or the yarn uh, 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 warehouse. Uh, but also we find that they can be used in a colony or a province and all of the stores within it, right? And, of course, they can also be used uh, in an entire sovereign state and all of the provinces within it, right? So, in other words, what I'm trying to show is the reddishness is getting lost and the bluishness is growing, partly through forms of no less and less specificity as to the what, where conditions, right? But, of course, there's still something else outside the sovereign nation state. Who can, who is, how does the bill formulate its user? So the one that is specific to a store, in the act of using it, you self-formulate as customer versus other social categories of people. Right? Uh, in the ones that are usable in an entire uh, colony or province, you are a resident of a locale. Right? And eventually, as a citizen of a country. Right? Issued by home. 
by folks in this, I have no other word for it, but I essentially, essentially mean, recall that slide on which merchants, trade, traders, manufacturers, stage owners, tavern keepers, ferrymen, all those people were printing, regular folks, right? That's what I mean, uh, the, the, the social identity of the issuers, they're just regular folks, right? Uh, sometimes they self-formulate as themselves as firms, like the Delaware Bridge Company, but we don't, or, or, or the, or, or the various banks that call themselves banks, right? But we don't really know exactly what they are. Sometimes they self-formulate as a province or a state, and of course, a federal government, which is when they seem most bluish to us, namely you and me. Terms of use are specified, right, in calendar time on many of them, right? On 1780, on January 1, 1781, you can get uh, gold and silver for me. Later on, terms of use, there is no term of use specified. It seems like it is what T.S. Eliot would call, it has become sempiternal, usable in perpetuity, as it were, to just an implication of the absence of specification. The legislation, the statute and assembly is specified. Therefore, the act, the kind of, uh, the actual uh, assembly and which bill it passed, all of that is spelled out, all of that becomes non-specified, right? Taxes, well, specified as payable in the beginning, non-specified. In other words, what we're looking at is the rise of a standard register of money token conduct, right? Based on the deictic non-selectivity <laughs> of all of the variables of participation framework, entity type, usability characteristics, and all the rest of it in a kind of historical progression. Or we might say how to remake the world through cultural shifters, right? Which is an issue that I can talk about some more tomorrow uh, if I, uh, I'm, I'm, I want to now quickly move to the last and final most wonderful part of all of it. Everything so far is just prehistory. The fact is, once you've got a solidly con consolidated set of intuitions about what is for you, whichever you it may be, the blue stuff here and now, there's always more red stuff. So here are what we call digital game tokens today. Go on, say it. It's not real money, right? Right? That's the intuition that all of us would have about it, right? And there's no harm in having it. It's fine. Uh, my point is, it, for most of us, it's not real money. In this game, Dragon Heroes, there are six pecuniary media. There's wings, gold, rubies, which are very important. Those are the ones at the very top. Then there are other ones called keys, medals, and emeralds, which are subsidiary with more limited use. Wings are used for the chance to play the game. The server automatically provides 10 of them every minute. Gold can be earned in-game by achieving missions. Rubies can be earned in the game, which is not easy, or can be purchased with real money. Many of these things also have a <clears throat> more elaborate life in a massively multiplayer online role-playing games like Lineage, where, in fact, the, the, the set of roles that you can inhabit inside the game is much more complex than in Dragon Heroes. Moreover, uh, the, the, money, the pecuniary media that function as game counters uh, and the objects that can be created in the game are readily sold for real money, so-called real money, outside the game. In fact, recently, an elderly lady who had tried to um, uh, uh, tried to magically transfigure a, a sword that cost thirty thousand dollars somehow lost it in the game. And she sued the company because its market value outside the game was $30,000, right? So in fact, there's all kinds of relationships in this world of not real money with what we, for whatever reason, call real money, right? And li live on and depend on. But the most interesting example of stuff that isn't real money in a much more interesting way is Bitcoin. So I want to talk a little bit about Bitcoin. And I want to talk about it because Bitcoin formulates itself as an alternative to state-issued money tokens. And by the way, there are now many forms of cryptocurrency and all kinds of things can be said about them. I'm just picking Bitcoin because it was the first one. It's, Bitcoin is not issued by any government. It's not a state-issued money token. There is no central authority. In order to describe Bitcoin, even in the very minimal way that I propose to do, it is necessary to describe a lexical register and an algorithmic protocol. Let's take a small step in that direction. What's a digital money ecosystem? 
It's an infrastructure created by algorithms and technologies which enables people to store and transmit Bitcoin information partials from node to node in a digital network. Bitcoins are a virtual currency. There are no physical coins or even digital coins as such. The coins are implied by messages that effectuate transactions and are verified in a ledger. A Bitcoin lacks the identity conditions of pieces of metal or, or pieces of paper. Bitcoin only exists as a money token. It exists as such only when certain forms of digital semiosis occur. After this, it exists as a transaction record. What's a Bitcoin owner? Bitcoin users own keys which allow owners to unlock Bitcoin information and transfer it to another. The keys are stored in a digital wallet, so-called, on the owner's computer. The wallet doesn't store Bitcoins, it stores keys. You can start using uh, uh, Bitcoin by downloading a Bitcoin protocol stack, which is open source. If you have a protocol stack, you can engage in Bitcoin transactions and Bitcoin mining. Mining is a term used to describe the activity of finding solutions to certain mathematical problems by using your computer's processing power. You don't need to know any math. Your stack and processor solve the problems. Using these devices, someone on the network is able, on average, to solve the problems every 10 minutes or so using their stacks and their processors. This is called mining a Bitcoin on the network. The network is a peer-to-peer -peer system. There is no central bank, no central authority that issues are regulated. The algorithm does all of that in a transparent and effective way, uh, transparent to mathematicians, uh, uh, but nonetheless, to someone who knows the code, totally transparent. The Bitcoin protocol reduces the question of money token transactional conduct to two problems. Is the money authentic and not counterfeit? That's called the trust problems. The trust problem. And second, can anyone else claim that the Bitcoin belongs to them and not me? That's the double spend problem. Uh, Bitcoin solved these problems through an algorithmic protocol and a secure public transaction ledger called the blockchain. The central innovation behind the blockchain is a distributed computational system called a proof-of-work algorithm. A proof-of-work algorithm which arrives at a mathematical consensus about the state of transactions over the entire network every 10 minutes. The mathematical principles underlying all of this are fairly elementary. Uh, Bitcoin is used nowadays for almost every type of commercial transaction imaginable, from everyday retail transactions at coffee shops to high-end retail transactions in the art world to charitable donations, international import-export, and so forth. And yet, although the system is used for almost anything, it is not used by the majority of people who use money tokens in the world today. It's new, it's unfamiliar, it's confusing, and it may fail one day, or it may not. Many people have never heard of it, many use it quite a bit. Because of its alleged anonymity, it is also used in a large number of illegal activities, along with legal ones. What's a blockchain? To get clear about this, we have to ask another question. What does a Bitcoin transaction look like? A user, let's call her Jill, downloads the software. She gets an address. It looks a bit like this. It's a unique identifier, the equivalent of a personal proper name, her Bitcoin name. And when used in transactions, it works like a signature. It is her only identifier on the network, which is why it's called her address on the network. The address is stored in her digital wallet. Although she now has an address, Jill doesn't have any Bitcoin yet, but her friend Adam does. So she gives him $50 and her Bitcoin address. He checks the exchange rate with US dollars. Let's say it's $100 per Bitcoin. So he uses her address to transfer 0.5 Bitcoin to her wallet from his own wallet. This transaction is recorded in the network. Once it is recorded, everyone can see it. At first, it is unconfirmed. In order to get on the blockchain, a Bitcoin miner has to pick it up and include it in a block of transactions. Once a new block is created, every 10 minutes or so this happens, it is recorded on the blockchain as confirmed. The Bitcoin, along with her ownership of it, exists as a social fact. She can spend it now. The blockchain has multiple copies on multiple servers, so you can't fake it. Also, it's computationally secure. It uses public key cryptographic methods 
This type of cryptography relies on certain mathematical functions like prime number exponentiation and elliptic curve multiplication, which are mathematically irreversible in the sense that it is easy to calculate from inputs to outputs, but not the other way around. You cannot calculate the inputs by starting from the outputs. Now, I've just given you a very brief sketch of the discursive architecture of Bitcoin. I'm sure you don't fully understand what it's all about, <coughs> nor do I, <laughs> right? This illustrates the more general point. No one is familiar with all the forms of money token that occur in their own society. We, we don't even have to go to hedge funds and derivatives to, to get that, right? Uh, if you and I are unfamiliar with this one, you and I are much like the folks I quoted from the Bankers Magazine of 1858. Remember, we were saying credit and credit and, and, and money are, are, are for always going to be like fire and water, right? We don't understand it. We don't call it money. Welcome to a new form of discursive semiosis. And here is a little glimpse of its expanding and registerment. So in 2010, uh, the market capitalization of Bitcoin was around a quarter of a million, and in 2014, it's about five and a half billion, right? In 2010, the dollar value was about, you know, less than $4,000 and uh, of, the, of the volume per day of transactions, and then in 2014, it's $50 million or more. Now, this doesn't tell us about the demographic characteristics of the social domain of its users. Uh, it's just statistical data. But it does tell us that it's vastly grown from when it was, right? Uh, from where it was before. Now, the next final issue here is that when will it become money? Who knows, right? And in fact, there's some un in principle reason why the answer has to be uh, who knows, because the battle between the red stuff and the blue stuff never stops. So on this little slide, I've used um, the red uh, highlighted lines are ones which mark events that make uh, Bitcoin look less like real money. For example, when People's Bank of China states Bitcoin is not legal tender, that was December 5, bad day for Bitcoin, right? The blue lines are upswings. So for example, when Bank of America reports uh, finds Bitcoin viable in money market transfer, it makes it slightly bluish, right? I'll let you read the rest of it uh, and I'll just uh, uh, summarize my concluding remarks. I've been arguing that all money token conduct is a form of social interaction. To speak of money is to speak of a class of social indexicals. Money has no essence because this class is not denumerable in the sense of set theory. <laughs> Uh, but is best viewed as a class of cultural shifters which are variably anchored in society and which differentiate limitlessly varied forms of social interaction. It will be obvious that what I have described today is only the, the tip of an iceberg. All money token conduct relies on linking discursive and non-discursive forms of semiosis to each other. In the case of cowries, the discursive exponents of conduct are entirely absent from the money token itself. In the case of Bitcoin, discursive semiosis fully constitutes the money token itself. There is very little else. The case of script artifact is an intermediate case. I focused on this case mainly because since it is the dominant form for us even today, many varieties of it are available for inspection and examination in the archival record. We like to keep archives of whatever is our dominant form. Unfortunately, however, not all money tokens are archived. The archival record consists mainly of script artifacts that are state-issued money tokens. Although I've been able to find a few others, as you can see, right? But even this is quite useful. Looking at historical changes in the forms of discourse they embody a script and the forms of legislation that enable their state-stipulated money token use clarifies the ways in which they create and transform what we take social reality to be. These script artifacts are also important because much of what they make denotationally explicit back then, we tend to encounter today more implicitly as ritual or as routine conduct. As such, as each of the semiotic partials of money token conduct were created, they had to be explicitly described on the money token itself to those unfamiliar with them, to those for whom they were news. We don't even read them anymore. Once they become tacitly assumed, as in our routinized usages today, we mistakenly view them as social reality. They are not. They simply reveal some of the bluish parts of it. They simply reveal some of our most widely and registered semiotic partials, obscuring everything else. 
Finally, they say that money talks. This is really not true. People talk to each other through it. I've just been trying to show some of the ways in which that happens. Thanks so much. Yes. Um, thank you very much. It was exciting. A lot of thoughts. I would like to concentrate on two uh, comments slash questions. Uh, one of them is uh, related to the money talks of those little performative utterances that are printed on the bills. So there are two, uh, two thoughts related to that. First is that uh, while you don't find it on all the bills, for example, I just checked in my wallet, you don't find it on euros. Yes. As far as I remember, in, on Russian rubles, you don't find it as well, because it was something that was striking for me. Yes. To read on the American. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, it's, so it doesn't have to be there. And then another thing related to the, you know, you have it on pounds, and you have it on the United States dollars, between New Zealand and Australia. It's interesting that yeah, on, on pounds, you have I, the Queen. You, you mentioned that, and on the United States uh, dollars, you have a reference to some kind of democratic institution. So it's uh, it's issued by uh, Congress or yeah. It says that this bill uh, is is usable for all debts, public and private. That's all it says, right? And, and this is legal tender, and then it has the signature yeah. of those officials. Yes. So there is some kind of embeddedness in, in the absolutely institution. yes. And then it's uh, regarding the, the idea of different frameworks of democratic and non-democratic. It's interesting that you have the queen. Absolutely. Yeah. So that was more of a comment like. And the, and the question like, um, it, 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 your red versus blue distinction made me think about uh, an interesting period in, in Russian history when, well, when, you know, was a breakdown of, of the Soviet economy. And instead of being paid in like paper or coins, people were paid in what, what we call nat natural products. So if you work at a tire factory, or you yeah. can also be paid with an interesting kind of script to be a share. Yes. That. Yes. So what kind of thing? Uh, so yeah, it's not. This is again coming back to the question: red and blue is not so blue things are still red things, are not necessarily archaic and something in the past. If it happened, emerged, you know, yes. back at any moment. In yes. And then again, how, what what is it? Is it really money that tires that that I'm being paid? What is it? What kind of thing is it? All right, so let me take those questions in turn. First of all, regarding the genres of how there are more than two or three hundred countries around the world, each of them produces money. I can assure you that this genre that I've illustrated from the uh, United States, Britain, New Zealand, this is by no means universal. Uh, it is a fairly robust internationally recognized genre, but there are plenty of others. Uh, the case of euros is different because there is no central government that produces that particular right. So the point is that the actual genre that will, the, the actual form that, that the, that the self-description will take itself indexically connects that piece or that form of pecuniary media to the socio-historical and political, political conditions under which it emerges, right. Regarding the issue of the red stuff and the blue stuff, it should be obvious that what is blue to you will not be blue to the 17th, uh, 18th century Virginia settlers. Uh, for them, gold coin would be blue and, and, and tobacco initially red, but soon blue. Okay. <laughs> That's the whole point about these being cultural shifters, right? Uh, what I, the reason I use those colors, blue and uh, for some of them, was that today if I could be confident that everyone in the room would say, yeah, credit cards, man, that's the real money, you know. Uh, 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 so I was historically situating, I was color coding it with respect to my audience, that's all. And then finally, the very idea that, that money exists as a differentiable and unified class of entities in the world and that which is characterizable for all societies, even all present day societies, is absurd. I take that to be self-evidently absurd, right? What in fact we find is that certain kinds of dominant forms, which in the case of the American greenback is only 80 or 90 years since we have a universally usable state, centrally, central state administered 
uh, 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 kind of bill and which and no, no other right uh, but although of course now we all also have um, Bitcoin, <laughs> which the United States, uh, which the 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 the, the, I, the IRA, you know, the tax, uh, uh, the government, it, it treats not as money. It, it doesn't classify Bitcoin. The United States government does not classify Bitcoin as money, in the sense in which, for example, it would classify euros or something else as money. It classified is it as if you if you if the amount of Bitcoin grows, they they count that as. Uh, um, what do, you, what do they call it? Uh, interest <laughs> uh, on, 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 on properties owned. <laughs> it's a totally different classification. So in fact, uh, if, if the, the pecuniary media that were being used in recent Russian history in some locale were tires or some objects like that, uh, that's been going on in many, many other places in the 20th century even as, you know, as well. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be at all surprised by that, Frank. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, this is a kind of a question just before drinks. Yes, yes, yes. I suppose. Uh, thank you for a very uh, inspirational talk. Um, I was just wondering this last sentence about that money doesn't talk, people talk through money. Yes. And since you brought in this idea of Bitcoin, and this makes me think uh, about algorithm and uh, AI and uh, all that, so I was just wondering whether we should include a third color which might be violet <laughs> blue and uh, red together because that really uh, in the future exact, uh, might actually change quite a bit well relationship uh, one could use a dozen or two dozen more colors i'm all in favor of it <laughs> the reason why i only use two is that all i want to show is that what's blue today will certainly not be blue 50 years from now because yeah. it wasn't 50 years ago. That, if blue versus red suffices to make that issue clear, then two colors is all I need. But indeed, the number of cases, the, the number of forms of fineness of discrimination that one could attempt is far greater, right? The reason why I don't attempt that, by the way, is that it is better to understand the ways in which it function, functions as a shifter. In other words, how would you go about classifying forms of you-ness or that-ness or now-ness, if you see what I'm saying, to go back to speech event shifters? This is obviously not a speech event shifter, right? Uh, so just to make that point is what I'm saying, but your point is entirely well taken that, that our commonplace and <coughs> common sense uh, ideas about what money is are extraordinarily parochial. However, we get through fine in most European and other and North American places where whatever stuff we are using for money remains relatively stable, relatively stable. But of course, as you know, uh, that's not always the case, even in, in Europe and North America. Remember 2007, right? <laughs> uh, and of course, I'm not especially interested in Europe or North America. I'm interested in human societies, right? So if you consider that whole range, the set of issues about stability and instability, they, they can't be taken, assumed at all. But we have to say that th these are legal fictions that work well some of the times, some of the places, and not so well most of the time in most of the places. <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, thank you. This was such a rich presentation. I remember the reaction of my son when he lost some accessories on an online <laughs> Was yes, yes. So we yes, 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 uh, yes. My question is about the moral character of money. Yes. Uh, the link between morality and money, which has been polarized. Uh, yes. And in, in fact, brought in Paris, that yes. we talk about money must be seen as a broader transaction yes. order. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this bluish, uh, reddish kind of you know, trajectory that you have drawn, how, did it also signal shifting moral regimes? Or well, was it only about practical transactional kind of you know, Well, the way I approach the question is slightly different from that literature. Uh, back in the 19, back in the early 20th century, uh, writers like Durkheim and Moss and others wanted to find a way of fighting back against the utilitarian political economy of their time, right? At that time, 
and also, of course, people like Malinowski and, 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 and then Evans Pritchard and lots of other anthropologists began to talk about the moral sphere involving money. They used the word morality to talk about everything other than uh, utility maximizing homunculi, which is what uh, the, the Western economics of their time and place was proposing, right? I myself don't find the word morality to be a useful alternative, right? Because you can call it morality to be sure. But the fact is what I'm really trying to say is that, that rather, mor the word morality s draws too much attention to things like religion and ethics of that sort. I prefer to talk about it simply by saying that there are appropriateness conditions of use and non-use, right? If some of those issues of appropriateness can be described in a, in a meta language of morality, that's fine. But I prefer not to commit myself to something of that sort. Uh, but the, the way I'm pointing towards full agreement with the essence of what you're saying nonetheless is, I don't know if I said it uh, clearly enough because I said a lot of things, but every for kind of pecuniary media necessarily also has non-pecuniary functions. <laughs> and so the fact that it is indexical of belonging to a community, whether the community be a neighborhood or a store, a, a clientele, or a province or a nation state, right? That's all part of the structure of what this is. We just live in a time where state-controlled forms of pecuniary media dominate, and secondly, through didactic non-selectivity, the state has, in a sense, made itself <laughs> invisible <laughs> because we it's so naturalized we take it for granted. So anyway, so there are. But the general point is that uh, uh, the idea that money is for buying and selling is part of our folklore about it. But in fact, that's really just one positional point of view on it. Well, if, we, if there's going to be drinks, we'll be continuing over drinks as well, but please, other questions? Okay, um, well, um, I'll, I'll be brief, and then we can get to drinks um, soon after that. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you for a really interesting, provocative talk. I think you gave us a lot to think about and also to talk about over drinks. Um, um, but one of the things that really struck me was the sort of kind of this, this chronological or historical development that you trace also, but just the kind of the centralizing authority of uh, printing money and kind of deciding what it's, it's worth. And I was hoping, if you, I wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit more about like just the kind of broader or like other historical so, so, social um, things that are happening that kind of lead to that kind of centralization. Um, and then kind of like then opening it up again with something like Bitcoin. Um, so kind of what are the sort of infrastructural or like social determinant or conditioning factors that kind of contribute to this? Development? I was, there is, I was going to talk a little bit about some of this tomorrow, okay, okay, but you know. but the other thing that I, but not exactly about what you said, and I should say about it is that although in one of my previous charts, uh, there is no single arrow of time for these developments. In other words, all I'm simply trying to show here, right, is that less inclusive forms get incorporated into more in inclusive forms along multiple dimensions. But in fact, the way, the timeline of each of these developments, I've not tried to track it, right? I'm not saying that this one is always prior in time to the, right? In fact, it's better to think of these as, as multiple competing frameworks that tend to coexist in many places, right, for different subpopulations, right? The, the set of factors that are in play is so extraordinarily large that it is not possible to enumerate them. They have to do with all kinds of things. So for example, for the, for the early American colonists, the, one of the key issues was that all the precious metal coin that was available in, say, the colony of Massachusetts circa 1620 had been brought from England. And England only wanted taxes to be paid in precious metal coin. So it went back by ship to England. So the shortage right, had to do with this, with this sort of uh, 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 situation. There, there are many forms of asymmetric dependence uh, uh, that, that different political formations find themselves in. Well, ultimately, they respond to it in many different ways. The, the, when, in cases where the 
some form of pecuniary media becomes viable for state issued ones, right? And it doesn't always, right? It has to do with what are the rhetorics that they use to persuade people to use them, like the 5% tax, uh, right? They are attempting and struggling. The state is itself continuously struggling for its own survival in all of these cases. And the state can mean the, uh, you know, the general colony, the assembly of the colony of Massachusetts. It can mean the British crown. It can mean, you know, the state of, of New Jersey or the federal, right? They're always struggling. So, in fact, there is no simple answer to be given to external causes as such. But what we do, because there are too many, but what we do find is that some of the speciation of forms of pecuniary media can only be understood if you, if you understand what are the conditions within which it is attempting to create this new form and what it does in order to do it. And those are quite varied. Ultimately, there is no non-ethnographic or non-ethno-historical answer to be given to those kinds of questions. Okay? All right. All right. Yes, please. One more. Please. And we have five more. We do. We do. Have I, I'm in no rush. Yes. Uh, so th this may, maybe piggybacks on Elena's question. Um, one of the things that I really valued about uh, your presentation was how you uh, destabilize a, a certain dichotomy between money as something that's state issued and generalized um, and what was in a former day known as primitive money or primitive currencies. You show how the range of the registers of usage in both cases are quite fluid and that especially when you look historically, right, we move from red to blue and back again, maybe other hues as well. And it's, I think, a very important intervention. But uh, especially when looking at the rise of uh, uh, state authorized and monopolized forms of money, uh, you use uh, the metaphor uh, of standardization, uh, which of course, I think this is where, where it gets to Elena's question, uh, actually roots it within a historical process of the uh, articulation of the modern nation state as a historical process. Uh, and I'm wondering then the, the degree to which to which that, how that affects the argument of the, the fluidity of these categories. I mean, so that the, the TID spheres of exchange, this is not something I suppose that you could call uh, a standardized register of exchange, or if not, how would you describe it? Well, you see, the fact is that it's by no means the case that the state has stabilized the greenback. It, it merely appears to be so. So for example, hedge funds and derivatives are not organized by the state, even though they use greenbacks as their backing, right? Uh, the, one of the issues that has happened after 2007, that there wasn't even any industry internal regulation of those kinds of things. And therefore, those kinds of pecuniary media, just because, by the way, they, the, the numerical values of money amounts in their equations are expressed in dollars, which is true, that doesn't mean that they're dollars. They are a pecuniary media of an entirely different kind. It has a different interactional structure. So that's one kind of thing, right? But, but of course, I mean, there's the parallel with standard language actually maintains because standard precisely. language is yeah. exhaust the yeah. uh, language use. Yes, precisely. Uh, and 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 similarly, the if you look uh, if you look at this issue cross culturally, you have to see you immediately see that uh, even the very question of what counts. Okay. So far, I've been arguing that pecuniary media are never just pecuniary media. Let's turn to a much more interestingly difficult question. How do we know when something is pecuniary media at all in general? And what I'm, because, you know, just to give you an example, in, there are some situations, in, uh, even in present day societies, and certainly in the ethnographic record, where it is entirely appropriate society internally in some locale for uh, people to use, so what, one question is, uh, suppose you have state issued money tokens that are used in some transactions, right? The question is, are those the only pecuniary media used? And, and the ones that are used, are they used symmetrically or asymmetrically? So for example, in some cases, you might give favors for favors. In other cases, money for favors, <laughs> right? In yet other cases, money for money. In other cases, cows for favors. In other cases, cows for state-issued money tokens, you see? So the question then becomes, right, which among, what are the principles, what, 
one can give an ad hoc answer to this question right away as you can see. But what would be the principle that would allow you to give a non-ad hoc answer to the question, which among these various media are pecuniary media? And part of what I'm claiming is that there is no not, there, there is only the possibility of ad hoc answers. And the reason why they don't seem ad hoc to the one giving them is that the, the folk theories of the home society are so completely naturalized as meta criteria on how to even think about the problem, right, that, 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 that there's a natural solution to it, right? But I can, although it seems, and so this is actually, the, has happened quite a lot in so-called economic anthropology, where people go around all over the world bringing certain well-meaning European intuitions to try to show that there's greater diversity in the world than uh, the political economy or the neoclassical economic framework allows for. But the fact is that they're still bringing intuitions because they think that money is a thing. Oops. They think that money is a thing. They don't pose the question of how does anyone know what it, a thing is. Right? See what I'm saying? So, so in that sense, you see, even so although I can show that for anything that is plausibly called a, a form of pecuniary media by someone that it has non-pecuniary function, right? I cannot, there is no possibility of coming up with a comparative taxonomy for everything in the world that happens to be money because you're going to get a whole set of gradient things. So the fact is that, you know, the, 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 this is an interesting problem from a comparative point of view. But on the other hand, it shows the depth of what I mean by saying we're dealing with systems that are really cultural shifters. They will make locally, in, lo in particular locales, certain sets of criteria will make certain practices mutually intelligible to those who live in that locale and know those criteria, right? Uh, but in fact, the idea that this can happen translocally is itself part of the fiction. And in fact, no one even needs it to happen. All that really need is needed in some practical sense of need is that there is sufficient fractional congruence across all of these different models that when folks from one place go to another place, you know, they can manage things, <laughs> you see? Uh, and secondly, if there's going to be international trade, the, everyone who is party to international trade must rely on a translocal uh, standard. As long as those kinds of conditions are met, right, the enormous diversity of this phenomenon can continue happily to exist and will, I believe, always continue to exist, at least so far as always has, right? And, and in some ways, one of the things that all of this gets us to is forget money. I mean, what this is going, any socio-centrically organized political uh, activity routine in which many people have a shared understanding of what it is, right? A similar argument could be mounted. So for example, when, what is politics exactly? Considered translocally and, and so forth, right? So for example, in, if, in a certain kind of question, people say, well, politics, well, that means politicians are involved. You're just using the sense structure of English and then derivational morphology, right, which is built into the denotational stereotypy of the word politic. And that's how you know how to answer that question, right? But the very, uh, governments are involved, right? Uh, now, that's one extreme, right, uh, uh, answer. The other extreme is the personal in the political is the political, right? Which basically means that the word politics has no usability anymore, right? Anything, anything that's going on in my inner states, that's potentially political, right? So, but you see the point is that we don't really need to, I hope you don't need to answer that question. Certainly I will try to stay away from trying to answer it because it strikes me that, that there is in fact a much greater range of phenomena that should count as political if we were to examine them carefully, even in places like Finland and the United States. But, not, but I don't recommend going as far as the personal in the political, because that's just a way of making the word political no longer usable, right? But where that middle ground is and how it is to be constructed is, I'm, I'm proposing, a parallel problem to the problem that I'm identifying for the case of pecuniary media, right? And in its fullnessness, one doesn't need to solve it, luckily. <laughs> All we actually need is to have a clear enough understanding that we're dealing with cultural shifters. And secondly, the ethnographic ability to figure out how the metasemiotic formulations of the things and activities that are going on in whatever 
locale we're in, that we can track the relevant data and figure out what we need to figure out about that situation. You see what I'm saying? Uh, so in other words, because these are shifters, the, 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 the desire for translocal answers uh, is the thing to avoid. But that does not mean that any particular case will be immune from analysis. Uh, this is a good uh, point to thank for a very good question.